In this video, we're going to be talking about a more typical implementation of quicksort. And for this implementation, we are replacing the idea of finding the median element of the array with the idea of selecting a random element, expecting that over the course of the entire sorting algorithm that you might get roughly the same behavior. So we are changing. The only thing different from the previous code is that we have selected a random element. The nice thing here is I know for a fact finding a random element would take constant time. And just like we saw in the previous example, this line would take cn time. If I assume that I'm defining n to be j minus i plus 1. And I'm also going to define another variable I used in my previous problem, which is k. I'm going to let k equal s minus i plus 1. The reason we did this before and the reason we're going to do this again is that s is naturally in between i and j. And if we're thinking about s as a random number, s being the location of that random element p in sorted order, we have no indication ahead of time where that would be. So we redefine k to be a much more reasonable value that goes from 1 all the way up until n. And that will be much more convenient for what we have. Nothing else changed in this code down here. So I don't need to recompute those sizes. I already know what they are from my previous code. The size of this first recursive call is k minus 1. And the size of the second recursive call is n minus k. And now, because we are finding that element randomly, and we don't know anything about its position, if we assume it is truly random and there are no duplicates in this array, so let's write this down, assume p is chosen randomly. And when we say randomly, we mean uniformly randomly, so chosen uniformly randomly. and that A has no duplicates. Then if we choose a random element, it is equally likely that any of those random elements would be in any of the positions. So position I through position J are all equally likely. That means that this code is effectively computing a random number between one and N. And we are very comfortable with doing that when it's sampled from a ran uh, uniform distribution. So let's try and analyze this. My range of values for k are 1 to n. So let's think about what the best and worst cases could be. So best case and worst case. One might naturally think, well, that's one of those is going to be k equals 1, and one is going to be k equals n. Those are the extremes. So k equals 1 and k equals n. Let's see what happens. If we did that, our non-recursive work is cn, so this would be t of n is equal to cn plus t of k minus 1. If I'm plugging in k equals 1, I get t of 1, sorry, t of 0 by plugging in k equals 1, plus t of n minus k, and k is 1, so it's n minus 1. And for my other option, I would get k equals n, I get t of n equals cn plus t of k minus 1, which is n minus 1, plus t of n minus n, which is t of 0. Oh no, we've encountered an ob obnoxious problem here, which is that those two are the same. So we have two different things here, both of which look identical. That looks like a big problem. So actually, these are both the worst case. And if we think about what the code is doing, it's actually more obvious that these things are the worst case. Because when k is equal to 1 or k is equal to n, we are partitioning the array in a very stupid way. Which is, we are finding an element, doing a bunch of work to partition it and do all this overhead. And then the element is either going to be there, at the very end, or at the very start. If it's at the very end, it's the exact same as the other way. But we have to still sort all of this part of the array after having partitioned it. And that additional work is very, very inconvenient to do because we all we are doing is doing effectively selection sort. 
So what is the ideal thing to have happen? The ideal thing is that we're dividing the work in a sensible way. So this is the worst case. Let's fix our handwriting now. So this is not the best or worst case. This is the worst case. And I leave this to you as an exercise. We've seen this exact recurrence relation before. It, if you do your substitutions, it becomes an arithmetic summation. And you can show t of n is in theta of n squared. Let's talk about the best case. The best case runtime is that we make a very even split, that the element that we are selecting is in the middle, like n over 2. And if we have that, we get t of n is equal to cn plus t of k minus 1, which is n over 2, minus 1, plus t of n minus n over 2, so n minus k, this equals cn plus t of n minus n over 2 minus 1 plus t of n over 2. And now we're going to make a simple simplifying approximation here to make this a little bit nicer to work with, which is t of n is approximately cn plus t of n over 2 plus t of n over 2. Having done that, this is the exact same recurrence relation we saw with the median example, which was exactly the same as the recurrence relation we saw from merge sort. So our best case is that t of n is in theta of n log n. So our best case and our worst case are different, and they are quantitatively different in the way that they uh, appear asymptotically, and they're also functionally different in terms of what's happening. This case, the best case, looks like we partition the array so that everything over here is less than or equal to p, and everything over there is greater than p. And if we do that roughly in the middle, that seems like it's hopeful. So this problem should look very familiar to some previous examples we did when we were analyzing problems that had a random number in their recursive call. For those problems where a random number appeared within the recursive call, what we needed to do was to use conditional probability in some way. So let's try and set that up. We want to use conditional probability, and we're going to do this by drawing a number line for our random variable. We define this letter k so that it can be similar to those problems which we had seen in the past. So we define a number line for k. And on this number line, we have that on the end of k equals 1 and the end of k, k equals n. They're both bad. That is the worst case and the worst case. And in the middle, we have the best case at n over 2. So when we're trying to split this, this is actually fundamentally a little different than the examples we did in the past because where we're going to split it will be slightly different. We're going to split this problem in between the good and the bad regions. So I need to split it somewhere here and split it somewhere there because in the middle region, I'm in the good area. And on either of the flanking sides, I am in the bad area. What we did before was we took this information and we used conditional probability. So I, I can rewrite the expected runtime as the probability that k is in that first region, which I didn't label yet. Let's try and label it. I'm going to call that spot n over 4 and the other spot 3n over 4. There's nothing special about those values. I could have chosen n over 3 and, th and 2n over 3. I, those would work just as well. I just happened to choose these. So we need the probability that k is less than or equal to n over 4 times the expected runtime, given that that is true, plus the probability that k is between two values. We need to be careful while we write this. We need k to be between n over 4 and 3n over 4 at times the expected time given that we are in that region. So again, we need to be careful writing this down, right? This is n over four less than k less than three n over four. And now we need to add on our last case, which is that we are in that third region, the additional red region. So the probability that k is greater than or equal to three n over four times the expected time given that we are greater than or equal to three n over four. 
This is a bit of an involved process to write this out, and now we need to compute several of these probabilities. So some of these are easy. The fact that w the probability that we're between 1 and n over 4, well, it's going to be a fourth of the time. Similarly for the last one, between 3n over 4 and n, it's the exact same as the left-hand side, and it's symmetric. Which means that this last probability must also must be 1 half, because if we add up all of those probabilities, we must get 1. So those aren't too bad. And just like we saw with some of our previous examples, we're going to need to bound those expected times and see what happens. So I need to come up with bounds for the three expected times. Let's copy-paste those. So we have our three expected times here. Let's try and bound them above and below. They're less than or equal to, less than or equal to, less than or equal to. The additional cost, the non-recursive work for all of them is the same. There's no randomness there. These all take cn time, cn time, and cn time. Plus, they make two recursive calls. Remember that they are of size k minus 1 and n minus k. And we're choosing the worst possible choice of k within the region. This is where the picture can be very helpful, so let's zoom out and look at the picture. In the first red region, which is where this code is, and for the last red region, our worst choices of k are the ones that are farthest on the left and farthest on the right, respectively. So we have e t of k minus 1, and I'm choosing k equals 1. So this is e t of 0 plus e t of n minus k, and I'm choosing k equals 1. So I'm doing n minus 1, and this is with k equals 1. For the bottom one, we're doing k equals n. So we get e t of n minus 1 plus e t of n minus k, and k is equal to n, so that's n minus n, that's 0. Now for the middle region, we need to choose as bad as possible. This problem is entirely symmetric always. So we can choose n over 4 or 3n over 4, and they are both just as good. So k equals n over 4 or 3n over 4. Both of those would work. We get e t of n minus n over 4 minus 1 plus e t of n minus n over 4. We can do some simplification. I'm going to do this in place so that I can keep all this information nicely compiled. We have n minus n over 4. That's just 3n over 4. And n over 4 minus 1 is smaller than n over 4. So we can also simplify the expression inside here to n over 4. And now we have three very nice expressions, two for the red regions and one for the blue region. So let's use all of that information with our expression that we came up with for et of n and see what we get. So we get et of n is less than or equal to, the first probability was 1 fourth, times the first red thing appearing there, which is cn plus et of 0 plus e t of n minus 1. I'm just going to write these all in different lines so we can make it easier to look at. Plus 1 half times that middle region, which is cn plus e t n over 4 plus e t of 3 n over 4 plus 1 fourth times cn plus e t of n minus 1 plus e t of 0. Now, let's see what combines nicely. If we look at this, we have 1 fourth cn, 1 half cn, and 1 fourth cn. That combines to be cn. That is, should be entirely unsurprising because that is non-random. That is the deterministic part of the code. So it should, must always take the same amount of time. So et of n is less than or equal to cn plus we have a fourth et of n minus 1, a fourth et of n minus 1, and another a fourth et of n minus 1. Similarly for et of 0. And those et of 0s are just constants, so I'm going to approximate them away here just to make this code a little, or this expression a little bit nicer. So we have a 1 fourth plus a 1 fourth, that's a 1 half et of n minus 1, plus we have 1 half of the two middle terms, which is 1 half et of 
n over 4 plus 1 half et of 3n over 4. Now, we have an expression that looks ugly. We've actually seen exactly this before when we were studying some of our recursive examples. So, just so you guys can practice this, I'm going to leave this to you to analyze. We can use a recursion tree. We did exactly this before. You should try to do it on your own, though. So, I'm going to write that down for you so you can really see it. We did this before. Try on your own. You should get to et of n is in big O of n log n. If you need help getting there, remember it should be ident identical to an example we did in the past. Since it's in big O of n log n, we also know, because of some of the analysis we already did, like our best case analysis, where we showed it was in theta of n log n for the best case, that it must be in big omega of n log n because it, the expected case must be bounded below by the best case. So we have that since the best case is in theta of n log n, we know that the expected case must be in big omega of n log n. Therefore, for our final conclusion, we have that et of n is in theta of n log n. So this is an expected case of n log n and a worst case of n squared. It now seems peculiar that we might call this quicksort and not some other sorting algorithm because its worst case is worse than merge sort. So why do we call this algorithm quick sort? There are a couple of reasons. One is in practice, it tends to be faster. So calling it quick sort actually makes some sense there. The other reason that we call it quick sort is that merge sort has a serious problem, which we have not discussed yet, which is in order to run merge sort, you must create many, many, many new arrays in order to copy values around. To do a merge sort with no additional memory requirements is actually very difficult, and to maintain the same complexity is extremely hard. So if we want to have an algorithm that runs well most of the time and has no additional spatial requirements, so no additional memory reserved, quicksort is one of the best options. And in fact, our worst case is very rare if this is happening randomly. What is the probability that you pick either of these values here? The probability of that, that k is equal to 1 or k is equal to n, is 1 over n plus 1 over n, which is 2 over n, so very unlikely. And you can also see this in our picture we have. This region here is quote-unquote good, and it had a probability of a half of ending up there. there. We could expand that good region even more. If we have larger arrays, this is much, much more likely that you get a chip and conquer style problem than it is that you get a divide and conquer style problem. So the best case is much more likely than the expected case, which is somewhat visualized in the fact that the expected runtime is the same as the best case runtime. For our last implementation of quicksort, what we have here is a very minor modification, which is we are, instead of finding a random element, we're going to choose the first element. That takes, again, constant time, and with the correct assumptions, we could show that this is in and the same requirements. We would need to assume uh, A has all permutations equally likely. With that assumption, it is effectively the same as we just did. That is to get all the probabilities to work out exactly the same. It would be that that pivot element P is equally likely to be in all locations, and therefore we can assume everything the same as before, and the analysis would literally be identical to what we did before for quicksort. Quick sort.